Uh, I'm Rob Bjornsson. I lead the what we call the research support team here at the YCRC. So um, as you probably know, YCRC runs all of the clusters at Yale. Some of us are engineers, some of us are research support. And um, I'm one of the research support people, so I work uh, directly with researchers like you guys. Um, so this, these slides are all available there. It's a Google Doc or Google Slideshow. Um, that tiny URL will point to where it actually is. So, um, and I think we'll send this out to you afterwards, I assume, right? Um, there are some code examples that I'll walk through during the presentation. Um, we're not, this isn't a hands-on uh, presentation, but if you wanna go back and look at some of that code later, it's all in a GitHub repo, which is uh, that repo right there. And um, if you go to, that's where um, that github.com YCRC is where we put all of our repos. So the, uh, there's other stuff there as well. Um, fair number of public repos that you'll be able to see. Um, and that's just how you would clone it. That's a standard get pull. So, to get started, just a little bit more about who we are. So how many of you have used our clusters at some point? Have most of you? Okay, half. Um, so uh, HBC at different universities is run in different ways. Sometimes it's under central IT. Uh, sometimes it's under the provost. And here it's under the provost, which we think is a good thing because it really gives us a sort of research focus, an academic focus. Um, we've been around, I, I keep losing track, let's say seven or eight years as a center. Um, this is our building. So all of the people are here. All the equipment is actually out at West Campus in a big data center. Um, and we're really here to, to serve you guys. So especially my team, my team of research support people, um, uh, we answer tickets, we give presentations like this. Um, we're available for one-on-one -on -one consultations. We have office hours, we install software. We um, basically try to make uh, these very expensive um, high-end systems useful to you guys in whatever way you know you and we find. So feel free to reach out to us. A um, couple of websites that you're probably already familiar with. Um, this is the documentation website. So sort of the, what I think it was the hardcore documentation website. Um, this is the more uh, splashy website they're linked together, so you can you can you can start here. But once you start getting into documentation, you'll find this one I think um, really useful. Um, feel free to ask questions. I mean, there aren't very many of you, so um, no problem if you have a question along the way. I'd be happy to try to answer it. So um, we have two courses. There's sort of what we call the intro course and this course. They overlap a certain amount. Uh, this one assumes that you have a little bit more experience, but if you don't, don't worry, it's really not a big problem. They're both intended to kind of give you um, a couple of different things. Um, an introduction to sort of beginning HPC in general, which is information that would probably be applicable almost anywhere you went. And then things that are very specific to Yale, to how we run our systems, how our systems are set up, how our storage is set up, what the usage rules are, sort of the local knowledge, if you will. Um, so I'm gonna to try to cover as much of that as I can. Um, I'm gonna focus a little bit on um, something that, that was basically how to run efficiently on the cluster. We see a lot of jobs that are running really inefficiently. And there's some pretty simple things you can do to detect if your code is running crazily inefficiently and try to address it. And at, at least if you know it is, if you can't figure it out, you can talk to us and we'll try to help you. Um, and then um, I'll try to touch a bit on how to use parallel to speeder jobs up as well. There's a lot of, parallelism is a big topic. It can range from being very simple to incredibly complicated. Um, for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna kind of stick to the simpler stuff, but it's nonetheless um, very useful and applicable to a lot of people. Um, Things are always changing. Um, we're constant. So we, as you'll see, we have uh, four clusters right now. 
those clusters need to be, at least the components of those clusters need to be refreshed about every five years. There's always turnover. We're always adding stuff, uh, always increasing the storage capacity. So there's always changes. And I just wanted to highlight a few changes that have been going on in the last, um, and sort of in the recent history or the recent past. Uh, the most exciting is that um, sort of right now, um, we're standing up a new cluster called McCleary. That is gonna replace both of the life science clusters, uh, Ruddle and Farnham. So kind of probably by the summer, uh, we'll have phased those two clusters out and McCleary will take the place of both of them. Um, it's a very exciting new cluster. It's it's um, our first uh, water-cooled cluster. So liquid actually runs all the way onto the chips. Uh, there's a radiator on the chips um, to cool it, which means uh, they don't run as hot, which means they run much faster and um, using less power because it's a much more efficient way to cool them. So that's a big change for us. And, and we're really excited about it. Another thing we did um, probably about a year ago is we bought a big storage system that is all SSD. So until, until that system, all of our uh, storage systems are traditional hard drives, spinning hard drives, um, hundreds of hard drives. And uh, Palmer is entirely SSD. It's, um, we're um, transitioning to using it for our scratch space and our home space. Um, it's very good for small files or for random access to files because it, it's not mechanical. Um, and so that's another really exciting thing. Um, in terms of data protection, you should all be aware that um, the first approximation, almost nothing on the clusters is currently backed up. So if you have precious files, you need to kind of think about that. Um, that said, we now have snapshots on most of the file system. Snapshots mean if you delete a file or you change a file, the previous version is kept for a short period of time, usually less than a week. So if you accidentally delete some files and you realize it right away, there's a good chance you can get it back. Um, contact us as quickly as possible and we'll show you how to do that. So that's snapshots. Um, true backups where different versions, you know, multiple versions are kept for an extended period of time is something we've wanted to have for a long time. It, um, it's very expensive because we have, um, I keep losing track, let's say 15 petabytes of storage right now. So 15,000 terabytes. Um, to back all that up would essentially double the cost of storage, um, which would be a pretty expensive cost. So um, we haven't done it until now, but we got a really good deal on some storage and we're setting up uh, um, an initial backup system that'll back up some things. And so look for that when it's, um, when it's in production. We'll explain more about what, what is backed up there and whatnot. And the final thing that um, the PIs mostly need to be aware of, but you need to be aware of as well, is as of last July, we instituted um, charges for CPU hour usage over 25,000 hours per year per group. So if your research group um, uses more than 25,000 CPU hours in a given year, in a given fiscal year, there'll be a charge. It's a, currently a pretty small charge, um, we're ramping up the rate, um, something to be aware of. Your uh, your PI will get a bill every month. So if you may hear from your PI at some point if you're a heavy user. Okay, I just wanna show you this. this is, so this is a link to um, one of our document page, documentation pages um, showing um, our, the current situation with our four clusters. Grace, Farnham, Milgram, and Ruddle. So depending on what department you're in and possibly if you're using um, either sequence data or protected data, we're, we're gonna assign your group to one of these four clusters. Um, and that's where you'll have your account. As I said, um, within the next year, Farnham and Ruddle will go away and they'll be replaced by McCleary. So, if you go to this web page, then you can um, drill down further into individual pages for the for a given cluster. And I would encourage you to um, go to that page for the cluster that you're using and um, take a look. It has a lot of information about the different um, rules for that cluster, the different partitions on it, 
et cetera, et cetera. And I'll, I'll talk more about that stuff as I go on. So um, pretty much told you um, most of the stuff already about the new McCleary cluster. Um, uh, we name um, our clusters after important Yale people. Um, Beverly McCleary Hamburg uh, was um, an important person at the medical school. Um, we're gonna give everybody who currently has a Farnham and a Ruddle account, an account on McCleary, and that could be available to you as soon as the end of this week or next week. It's, we're very close. So stay tuned for an email saying um, that your account is ready. Um, so there'll be some period of time where you can um, try it out and um, make sure you're all set up there before um, we get rid of Farnham and Ruddle. So um, there's gonna be a number of changes for those of you who are used to Farnham and Ruddle as you move to McCleary. In many ways, we're gonna to try to make McCleary closer to the way Grace is in, in a lot of its rules. Um, so if you're, if you're familiar with Grace, that'll all make sense. If you're not, it won't so much. Um, probably the most important thing is that we're gonna create, we're, we're gonna to try to make what, what we think of as a clean break from Farnham slash Ruddle over to McCleary. So you're gonna get a new home directory, you're gonna get a new project directory, and it's gonna be up to you to move the files that you wanna keep from Farnham and Ruddle over to McCleary. We're kind of hoping that people will do a little housekeeping as they do that, um, and that we'll get rid of some old trash as we go. If you find that difficult, uh, get in touch with us and we'll, we'll help you um, move that stuff over but it's, we're not gonna do it automatically. Um, I think I'll skip the rest. So the rest of this is kind of details and it's also, um, it's documented in that, uh, that, web, that page at the, the bottom of, of this page. Um, okay. Um, I'm hoping that many of you are familiar with Slurm commands on the cluster. Slurm is the, um, the software system that you use to do scheduling on the cluster. So you use it to submit jobs, um, to um, kill jobs, to see how efficiently your jobs ran, all kinds of different things. Basically how um, users interact with the cluster. And these are the most uh, common commands. There's a, there's a lot of Slurm commands. Um, these are the most common ones that people use. Um, maybe just ask, is, does anyone, have any questions about any of that at the moment? Can I use the time frame? Uh, sometimes like uh, whenever we uh, submit the job by using this one, so they give error like uh, after a few times, like there is no time uh, time off like that. So what should be the time limitation? Yeah, that? so um, every job when it's submitted has a time limit. And if the job is still running, when that amount, once it starts running, the clock starts ticking. And if it's still running at the end of that time limit, the system will kill the job. So you need to provide, um, a, a, you know, ask for a limit that's going to be long enough. Um, when you submit your job, you can either explicitly give it a limit or you can accept the default limit that the system is giving you. And that limit is gonna be different for different partitions that you submit to. And I'll talk more about partitions in a minute, but a partition is, is a subset of the cluster, interactive, day, week, general. And when you submit there, there um, there's a limit on each of those partitions for how much time you can ask for. And it, it varies from uh, different partitions, a few hours to many days. So um, the basic answer to the question is to have an understanding of how long your job will take and to ask for a bit more than that, really. That's, that's how that works. Does that answer, answer the question? I mean, it, it, um, what I do is I ask, the first time I run something, I ask for the maximum I'm allowed because it doesn't really hurt that much to ask for more. Um, your job just might take a little bit longer to get scheduled because you're asking for a lot. And then once it completes and you know how long it actually takes, you can trim your request down a bit. Um, 
So um, the two most important commands, Slurm commands, um, that you've almost certainly used are sbatch and salloc. Um, sbatch is used to submit batch jobs. salloc is used to submit or to, to request an interactive session where you're actually logged into a compute node and, and using it interactively. Um, you may not be familiar with salloc because in the past people used srun. Um, so it's it's almost exactly the same as srun. It's just a little bit simpler. And so we're uh, recommending that people use salloc now rather than srun. With s um, srun, you had if you remember, you had to say srun dash dash pdy blah 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 bash. With salloc, you just say salloc return. So it's just uh, a little bit simpler. But it does essentially exactly the same thing. Um, yeah, I think that's any questions about S. Alec or, or anything on this slide? Okay. Yeah. Um, S. Max. So are you still need the dash thing to specify the like the time frame. Um, you can. Yeah. Right. So all of these uh, parameters that I have listed here. Um, as well, there are many more. Um, almost all of them are common between salloc and sbatch. So you can use them for either and you use them in exactly the same way. So, so if you wanted an interactive partition with four CPUs, that is a reasonable thing to do. You would say salloc dash C4. If you wanted um, a lot of memory in your, in your salloc, you can say salloc dash dash mem equals whatever. So it works. Um, exactly the same way as sbatch does. Yep, all the all the all those options work um, the same in sbatch. Good question. Yeah. Okay. So I, I have a couple of slides on user interfaces. Um, so um, historically, the way people used our clusters is they would use some sort of SSH um application like um uh, 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 moba x term for example or um uh I'm trying to think what some of the other ones are so there are all these applications you can run on your local machine that essentially do an ssh give you a command line onto the cluster from there you do s run or, or s batch or whatever um a lot of people still do things that way but um we have some other options, and I just wanted to um, show you that stuff. So the the one we're most excited about is open on demand. And how many of you have used open on demand on the cluster? Okay, so half of you have. That's great. So open on demand is is a web based interface to the cluster. It does a lot of different things. We find that a lot of our users, especially those who aren't um, extremely familiar with Linux, find it most um, comfortable. So let me show you how that works. Um, each one of our clusters has um, an open on demand um, tool for it. And you get in a browser and you go to ood name of cluster.hpc.yale.eu. And then you do a login through CAS. Let's see if I can do this right the first time. And then it brings me to the, the sort of welcome page for open on demand. And here's where you can see sort of all the different tools that are available. And I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I'll, I'll use it some as I go on, but just to give you a sense of what's available, um, there's a file browser here. So this is a way for me to look at all the files I have. I'm, I did this on Grace, as you saw. So this is showing me my, my files on Grace. I can do uploads and downloads between my local computer and Grace by, by using these buttons. I can um, navigate through here. There's a very simple editor, so I can do very simple file editing and kind of manipulate things. So think of this as kind of, there's a lot of tools that are like this that allow you to do file transfers and, and simple editing and things. Um, so that's one thing that Open On Demand does for you. Um, another thing it does is it gives you 
very easily a simple login to the cluster. So um, I did that kind of fast, sorry. So um, basically I just came here to get out of the way, to clusters and did this shell access. And that pops up a new tab in my browser and I'm on the Grace login node, just as if I'd done an SSH to the Grace login node. Um, so I can do normal things here. I can do sfrun, I can do sbatch. So for people who are really comfortable in the command line um, in a non-graphical environment, this is really convenient. Uh, another thing that uh, you get here is a bunch of inter interactive applications. Um, so the simple or the most straightforward, the most universal is a remote desktop. So that gives me um, a graphical desktop on a compute node. It's got um, X windows running so I can bring up graphical applications. I can do all that kind of stuff. I can also um, directly go to a bunch of graphical applications um, like R or MATLAB or Jupyter, um, et cetera. So um, this is a very nice environment for people who wanna be in a graphical environment and um, uh, sort of a familiar environment. So um, just I'll just show you a little bit of that. So this is the generic remote desktop, but all of these applications roughly work the same way. When you click on them, you, you're brought to this screen, which is a form. It's basically letting you configure a job because um, what's really happening here is we're, we're configuring a Slurm job that job is going to run on a compute node and then either start a remote desktop or start R or start MATLAB or whatever and display it back. And so this form is letting you choose many of the same things that you would normally choose with sbatch or srun, like how long do I want it to run? How many CPUs do I want? Do I want some um, GPUs? Do I want, um, do I, which partition do I want to start the job on? All that sort of stuff. Um, once I've set up all my configuration, I hit launch. So what's happening now is it's submitted a job. If I did an SQ, I would actually see that job um, in the job queue like any other job. Once that job gets scheduled, then um, the view changes here. I can go ahead and launch. And um, now I am in um, on a compute node in a graphical environment. I can run any graphical application here in the normal way. So um, this is pretty nice. So um, I don't think I'll go into any more depth with open on demand unless there are specific questions about that. Yeah. I always use the R Studio on the cloud environment, and I tried before to use the um, R Studio on the server. I never got what is the main difference between them. Um, this is an excellent question. So the R, they're under the covers, they're extremely different. The R Studio server is actually a container um, with all the software built into it. So it should be more bulletproof. So we've been trying to phase out the Conda one. The condo one is just a little bit more um, flexible. So if you have a very specific environment that you need, you can build your own condo environment and launch that. So it's really, I think it comes down to sort of convenience and bulletproofness on the server side and, and sort of a little more difficult to work with, but a little more flexible on the condo side. But there isn't a huge difference. I, I Like I say, I think we'd like to phase out the condo one but we're finding that some people still want it, so we haven't. Um, yeah. Any anything else? Yeah. Actually, uh, I tried to use the R Studio server one, and uh, whenever I want to generate a graphical view, so there is an error like uh, I need to uh, download and install like X X11 something packages. Hmm. So could you help me for that? Okay. Yeah, you should get in touch with us, and we can help you with that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yep. Or you could set you could set up um you could set up a one on one session. Probably be good for you to show us exactly, like walk us through it, so then we can see. Yep, it's. I will admit it can be kind of tricky. I mean, that sounds like that should just work, but we sometimes run into problems when people are trying to mix R 
and Python together under our studio can get really complicated to get all of those dependencies right. Um, what you're talking about should should just work. So get in touch with us and we'll see if we can work through it. Yeah. So I was wondering, this is a typical example that you request a session is available in a moment or two? Or... Yep. Yes. So um, how, so that's a, the, the general question is when I submit a job, how long will it take it before it runs? And um, it can vary depending on how busy the, this, uh, the cluster is, but it also primarily varies depending on your request. So that request that I made was to the interactive partition and the, the intent of the interactive partition is you should never have to wait. So um, on the other hand, there's there's some real limits on the interactive partition. Like you can only have, depending on which cluster you're on, a couple of jobs there. They can only run for a short period of time, like six hours maximum. So by keeping um, the amount of resource that any user can ask from interactive small, we're able to keep it um, you know, available so that your jobs will quickly schedule. If on the other hand, you submit a job that's asking for um, an entire, all the CPUs on a given node, like like 20 CPUs or 36 CPUs, where you, in practice, what you're really doing is asking for all of the node, or you're asking for a lot of memory, so you're taking all the node. If the cluster is really busy, that could wait for hours sometimes. So it really depends on the size of your request and the partition that you're making the request to. And a little bit on the cluster, actually, to be honest. Um, some of the clusters are busier than others. In practical terms, is the bookkeeping on and CPU hours here for the wall time of the of the interactive session? Or? It's it's for it's for how long it actually ran. It's not how much you requested. It's 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 the number of CPUs you ran on and the amount of time it actually ran from the time it started to the time it ended. But in, in wall time or in, in wall time. Well, as opposed to CPU time or what? Yeah. That's yeah, no, it right. So if, if your job is um, not using the CPU, like say you did a sleep for 10 hours and in uh, in your job, you'd still get charged for 10 hours. Yeah. Um, and currently, this really needs to change, but currently um, GPUs are not being charged. So, um, which is obviously kind of wrong because GPU hours are actually very expensive, um, but uh, that just isn't enabled yet. Okay. Any anything else? Um, we're not going to have an open on demand for McCleary immediately. Um, so when McCleary comes up either this week or next week, you'll just be on the command line. But um, we plan to have one up as soon as possible. Um, how many of you have used a terminal multiplexer, either um, screen or TMUX? Okay, so that's less less of you, fewer of you. So um, one of the issues um, with using the cluster in, a, in an interactive way, as opposed to a batch job is um, you, your interactive session only stays alive as long as you stay connected to it. So, you know, the typical thing you SSH from your laptop to the login node, you do an S alloc from there to a compute node, and you start running something like like R or whatever, something that's interactive, but is going to take a while. Um, if you, you know, if your connection gets dropped or you shut down your computer, or you go home, you, you sort of you lose that connection, and the job is going to get killed. That's that's the standard uh, behavior of of an S run. Once the connection is lost, the system cleans up the job. Um, so that's kind of a pain. And a terminal multiplexer is a really nice way to get around that problem. Um, our favorite one is Tmux. And I just, so Tmux is a very complicated tool. It can do a lot of things. Um, but the basic idea is um, when you get onto the login node, if you, instead of just immediately doing an S run or immediately doing whatever you're doing, you start Tmux, then everything you do inside of Tmux is held by Tmux. And you can disconnect from Tmux, go home on a completely different computer, re-log in, reattach to your Tmux session, and you're right back where you started. So we've got on the website, if you search on our documentation website for Tmux, you'll find a whole page on it with 
lots of information about the details, but um, I just want you to be aware that there is such a thing. I I have a Tmux session running on every one of the clusters all the time on, on the login node. It really doesn't take any resources when it's idle, so we don't mind. But that lets me, when I come in in the morning, I attached, I attached to my Tmux on Grace and I'm right back where I was the day before. And um, if I have an interactive session of some sort, I can do an S run within Tmux and that will also stay alive. So that's a little bit complicated, but um, I find it really useful. Uh, one thing we see people mistakenly doing is doing an S alloc to a compute node and then running Tmux there. And that's not, that doesn't really make any sense. <laughs> you want the Tmux to protect the S run or the S alloc, not the, not the reverse. So all, basically, I can't think of any good reason to run Tmux on a compute node. You should, you should run it on the login node and from there do an S run or anything else. I see, I see a little bit of perplexed look. <laughs> um, um, the other little gotcha there, I, you probably know that we have two login nodes for each cluster for redundancy. You may or may not know that, but when you SSH to Farnham say, you're gonna arbitrarily be attached to either Farnham one or Farnham two. And you'll see that in the prompt. The prompt is either Farnham 1 or Farnham 2, even though you're logged into Farnham. Um, that normally doesn't matter very much. You don't really care which you're on because they both see all the same files. They you know, see the same compute nodes. Their environments are the same. But Tmux is either running on one or the other. So um, if you're using Tmux, you need to go back to the same compute node in order to be able to be attached to it. So you just gotta, gotta remember where you were. I, the way I handle that is I always explicitly SSH to one of the one of the login nodes, like Farnum one, rather than saying SSH Farnum, I say SSH Farnum one. So I'm always on Farnum one. I know my Tmux is there. Any questions about Tmux? <laughs> yeah. I can still kind of wrap my head around like the double bit. Or like returning to a login node and someone who does kind of like sends it to the compute node and lets it run and then like gets the output. Um sorry, I didn't yeah, try to say, say, say it again. Explain a little bit more about um like the, the benefit of like maintaining that session. Sure. And what, maybe what a lot yeah, let me let me let me show you. Uh if I can I get this out of the way. Okay, so here I am on Grace. I'm on happen to be on Grace too, which is kind of handy because I don't have a Tmux there. So I imagine I've just logged into Grace too, and I I start Tmux um, like that, and it looks like nothing has really changed. But I'm now this session that I'm in this this shell is actually held inside of Tmux. So um, if I did something like um, s alloc, oh. I have to cheat because I've got too many things going. Okay, so I did an S alloc and um, now I'm on some other compute node and I'm, I'm just gonna start some random application that's gonna refresh. So top is you know just showing what's going on node. Um, so I'm gonna detach from this session now. Um, you'll see that Tmux has kind of, so how do you interact with Tmux? How do I send information to Tmux rather than sending information to, to this shell here to what it's running top? The way you do that is um, you've inter you you um, preface everything with control B. So if I do a control B and then I, I do D, so control B D says detach to Tmux. So all of the Tmux commands are control B something. Um, control B D detaches. You see I'm back on the login node, Grace2. So I could actually just go home at this point and kill that session. Um, come back here, imagine it was later in the day. I, I re-log in to Grace. Yes, good, I got Grace too. That's the only trick. So I'm back on Grace too. And um, I can say Tmux, attach. Um, and I'm right back into that session that was held by Tmux. So 
um, this is and this is just incredibly useful because I can save this state um, over long periods of time. And um, another really useful thing in Tmux is um, I don't have just one window. I can make multiple windows. So if I um, say Control B C, this gives me a new shell, and um, you can start toggling between these. So you end up with a bunch of, I think of them as screens or windows within a single TMUX session, each of which has its own state. I can move between them. I can detach from it. I can go home. I can reattach, come back tomorrow, reattach. So it's all a little complicated, I, you know, I, I admit. But um, once you get used to it, it's incredibly useful. So TMUX is running on one of the login nodes. TMUX itself, it's just a very lightweight program running on the login node. And it can start multiple bash sessions. Within those bash sessions, I can actually do an S alloc over to a compute node. So it's a, it's a little complicated, but you can imagine like I have this sort of centralized TMUX that then has tendrils going out to lots of different compute nodes, potentially. If that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it it's sort of to, in my mind it sort of groups all my work together in an organized way and 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 lets me. So the um, this Tmux has no time limit it, 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 unless um, Grace two gets rebooted could happen, but unless Grace 2 gets rebooted for some reason, this TMUX will stick around. So it could be around for weeks and weeks. Um, and then I just, it's up to me to kind of clean up my my windows within it um, as time goes on. So I don't just end up with a lot of junk in there. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, whenever you create a TMUX session, I use a name for, 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 just for the TMUX a... session? Yeah. yeah. And then you said about the number one and number two cluster. I never use that. And then if I create multiple sessions in the three modes, I need to mute which one I have created because you can't create on the other. Yeah. Or yeah. The other. Right. So you bring up a couple interesting points. One is so I because otherwise I'm going to get really confused. I only have one TMUX session on every cluster. I know which compute node, oh, sorry, which login node it's on. I don't bother naming it because I have only one. But you you can actually name TMUX sessions that have multiple TMUX sessions on a given host. And then with each one of those, you could have multiple windows. Right? There, there's a lot of, and then it turns out you can actually break the screen into multiple panes. And there, there's a lot here, most of which I don't use. But um, I think if you just if it's clear in your mind what's going on here that there's this Tmux process that's someplace, and you can attach and detach, you know, attach and detach from it, and you need to know where it is, and then inside of that thing you do your work out to the compute nodes. I think those are the important concepts to have. Yeah. How to explicitly connect to Grace two using the asset? Ah, <laughs> right. Good. So. Um, there's no way you can't do that here. You, this this one does not give you that ability. This this interface. Um, but if you're on any other SSH client, um, rather than saying grace.hpc.yale.edu, just add the one or two. So just say grace one dot and, and then it'll work. Yeah. Yeah. That it's a, it's maybe maybe we should add that here. I don't know. It's an interesting question. Okay. I like TMUX, so it's always fun to talk about it. Um, okay. Um, I have a few slides here on just how to think about the cluster resources. What time is it? Okay. Um, so I like to think about this as, as the cluster has these resources. It has nodes, it has CPUs, it has GPUs, it has memory, it has storage. You want to keep a few things in mind. Um, the first is modern um, servers, modern compute nodes have a lot of cores and a lot of memory. So the ones we're buying now either have 48 or 64 CPUs on a given node. So when you submit a job, 
most of the time you're not asking for an entire node. You're asking for a slice of a node because you're asking for less than 64 CPUs. They're, they're going to have, the new ones are going to have uh, upwards of a terabyte of RAM, which is very exciting, but you probably don't need a terabyte of RAM. So, so you're going to always, almost always, most of your jobs will be asking for a small slice of a given compute node. And so, um, your job is going to ask for a certain amount of memory and a certain number of CPUs, and your job will be penned into that. And it won't be able to use more CPUs. If it tries to use more memory, the system will kill it. So um, if you see that your job dies with a memory error, you need to ask for more memory and rerun it. That takes you know some experience with your given application and your given data set, because every, every application is different. Um, So this slide has a lot of words on it. Um, a couple of important things. Um, there are these options, little c, which is shorthand for CPUs per task, little n, which is shorthand for n tasks, and big N, which is short for uh, nodes. Users get these confused all the time, and it's because they're confusing. It, it absolutely makes sense. Um, the simple rule of thumb is you're almost always interested in dash C. So the, the, all three of these flags have something to do with parallelism, with, with getting more than one CPU operating on your, on your code so that your code goes faster. They all kind of have that flavor. Um, but unfortunately, it's a little bit confusing. Um, almost always it's dash C that you want. The only time it's little n, tasks that you want is if you're running an MPI program, a message passing program. And you probably know if you're doing that. I, I would hope that you would know that. So very, it's a program that's been explicitly parallelized to use MPI. Um, they tell you to launch it in a particular way using MPI run or something like that. That's the only time you use dash N. Otherwise, you're just going to be wasting resources. And the big N is essentially all it does is, is map your code in a specific way on a specific node. So it doesn't really increase the amount of parallelism. It's it's just a hint to the, to the system about how to map it. It's a very advanced flag. Um, you gotta be using MPI for it to make any sense. And even then it's only in very special cases that, that you need it. So um, my short advice is um, don't use the little N or big N unless you know what you're doing. <laughs> And we see it all the time. And what will happen is most of the resources that somebody asks for uh, will go completely idle and um, their job will be packed into a single CPU and run really slowly. I'm gonna talk a little bit later how to detect that situation. Um, we have um, some nodes that are special, some compute nodes, the, um, GPU nodes, which have GPUs, which are graphical processing units. Um, those are specialized coprocessors, essentially, that programs that know how to use them uh, can get a lot of benefit from. You'll probably know from the documentation of your program if it can do that. If it can, then you can request GPU nodes and GPUs. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then we have the uh, what we call big mem nodes, which are nodes with uh, an exceptional amount of RAM. So for um, most, of, you know, most of our nodes have a reasonable amount of memory but there are some applications that need a lot. And so we, uh, we always buy a few nodes with a lot of memory. We put those in a special partition. Um, how many of you know what I mean by partitions? Is that, is that is everybody familiar with partitions on the cluster? Kind of. Um, okay, well, a few words about that. Um, a given cluster has a lot of different nodes, a lot of different servers on it. And we subset those into things called partitions. Um, when you submit a job, you're always submitting to a particular partition, not the cluster as a whole. Why do we do that? We do it for a couple of reasons. Um, some partitions are special because the nodes in them are special. Like they have GPUs or they have a lot of memory. Other partitions are special, or we use other partitions because they imply, they, they come with them a certain set of rules. So the interactive partition, they're not special nodes, they're perfectly normal compute nodes, but they have 
jobs that go there have special rules so that they won't run too long so that and, and you can't use too many of them that way we can guarantee that there's always availability in the interactive partition um, day is a partition that limits your job to one day week is a partition that limits you to a week etc so um, all the different partitions have different characteristics and rules and you'll want to go to the cluster page for your cluster where we explain what that is for the given cluster. So that's all there is to that. Um, we also ha um, have on most of the partitions, there are limits as to how much one user or one group can use at a, at a given time, just to keep any particular group or user from um, dominating that partition. Um, there's another kind of partition I should mention, which is a dedicated partition. So um, there are researchers who bought their own compute nodes, dedicated compute nodes. We name a partition after that research group, and then only members of that group are allowed to submit jobs to that partition. So it's a way for a researcher to, to buy dedicated compute, basically. And those are also listed on the pages for the given cluster. So like the Grace page lists all the dedicated partitions on Grace. But hopefully, if your PI has done that, they will tell you and tell you how to access it. OK? okay I'm going to move along with this. A um, couple words on this. Um, we tend to run our clusters for a long time and we add to them over time. So Farnham has been around for about seven years now, seven, eight years. So what that means is as we're buying com uh, compute nodes every year and adding them on, we get different models of compute nodes. And those uh, different models have different Intel uh, chips in them. And it turns out Believe it or not, Intel slowly changes their instruction set over time. So the most modern um, Intel chips can run instructions that the oldest ones can't. So there's a, a little bit of incompatibility. <laughs> um, in practice, what that means is sometimes if you compile something on a really new compute node and you try to run it on a really old compute node, it'll fail because it'll say, I don't know that instruction. And this has been an irritation over time. We've been working really hard to make this as uncommon as possible, um, but it can still happen. The simplest solution to this is, um, well, when, so the simplest solution is to make sure when you compile, to always compile on the oldest instruction set on the cluster, on sort of the, the, the least common denominator. Um, we always do that when we build software for you. So if it's software we built, you should not hit this problem. Um, if you're building your own software, you want to be aware of this. And the simplest way to do it is to always ask for oldest when you're um, doing um, an allocation for, for a compilation. So you can see here, I'd say srun-c oldest. So we make sure that if you add the constraint oldest to an uh, to a allocation, we'll put you on um, one of the nodes with the oldest instruction set. And then it should generate code that'll run anywhere. Um, you'll see something like illegal instruction if um, you run into this problem. And if it's mysterious, get in touch with us and we'll, we'll walk you through it. Don't, um, don't compile stuff on the login node either um, for a lot of reasons. Always allocate a compute node. And I would recommend doing it with dash C oldest. This is a capital C for constraint as opposed to the little c, which is CPUs for task. Um, okay. So I already talked a little bit about partitions. Like I said, it's just a subset of nodes. Um, each one, each partition is independently scheduled. So jobs that are thrown on a particular partition are sort of fighting with each other. Um, there's always a default partition that you get if you don't specify. Pretty much all of the options that job submissions have have some reasonable default. You know, the number of CPUs, the number of uh, the amount of memory, the the, de the default partition, etc. Um, but you can specify a different one. Um, 
All the clusters have an interactive partition um, that you can use um, for, especially for development, like if, if you're like writing code in R or whatever. Um, interactive is nice because you really should never have to wait to get that allocation. Um, we have a rule on Farnham and Ruddle that you have to use um, interactive for um, S alloc because we, we had a problem with people submitting S alocs um, and not using them. So we force those onto interactive. On Grace, we don't care. Um, there's um, a partition I think a lot of people don't know about on all the clusters called transfer. Um, it is um, a small set of nodes that are, we, we want you to use them to do big data transfers, like transfers to off the cluster someplace. Um, they have really good um, networking, so they should be faster than the compute nodes for doing our sinks or um, stuff like that. Yeah, that's probably enough about that. I, I'll. Um, how many of you have you heard of the scavenge partition? Is that something people know about? Okay, have you used it? Okay. Um, so I mentioned that PIs can buy their own nodes. Um, they can give us money. We buy compute nodes and install them in the cluster. Give them partition. Um, they don't use them 100% of the time. So we noticed early on in this that um, we had some nodes being wasted while jobs were waiting because um, a, a given PI wasn't using their nodes all the time. So we set up the scavenge partition. And what it does is it pushes jobs onto PI partitions that are idle, PI nodes that are idle, um, with the, the caveat that if a job gets submitted to that PI partition that needs that node, your job will be killed immediately. So um, it's a little bit like take it at your own risk, um, but you can get a lot of resources that way. And if your jobs are either reasonably short or you can figure out how to checkpoint them, um, it can be a really nice way to get a ton of resources. So we have a fair number of people who've put the time in to figure out how to make their codes run effectively on scavenge, and they submit thousands of jobs to scavenge and really blow through them quickly. Any, any questions about that? Okay. I'm gonna skip that. So um, just a few hints on um, requesting allocations, things you can think about. Um, if you ask for what amounts to an entire node, either because you want all of the CPUs on the node or you want all the memory on, on the node. So you make a you make a big request like um, 36 CPU dash C 36 or dash dash mem 180. Um, that's fine. It's just that that requires an entire node to be idle. So, you know, an empty node. And it could be the way we schedule things. Um, nodes tend to get sort of balkanized a little bit. So you've got lots of little jobs running all over the place and it could take a while for uh, for any node to become completely free. And that would be especially true if you were running a big MPI job and you said, I wanted 10 completely free nodes. You're just gonna have to wait until the scheduler can arrange that. So sometimes it makes more sense to ask for less, to ask for half a node, half a node's worth of memory or half a node's worth of CPUs, um, just something to think about. Um, I'm going to talk later on um, about both task arrays and dead simple queue. Um, they're really nice ways to do big parallel jobs that don't require whole nodes. And so, um, because they can kind of find just little slots available in a whole bunch of different compute nodes. So that's, that's good to know how to do. Um, one thing a lot of people don't know is you can actually submit to multiple partitions. So um, when you say dash little p, you know, some partition name, you can say partition one, comma, partition two, comma, partition three. So for example, if, if your PI has a, a dedicated partition, you could submit to general, well, let's say in, in grace, day, comma, scavenge, comma, PI partition. And it would try all three of those partitions and whichever is available first, your job would run on. Um, yeah. Um, one, one thing we ask people not to do is to submit 
very large numbers of completely independent jobs. So what am I talking about? If you wrote a little loop in Bash that did a thousand S batches, that would be very easy to do. Um, and, if, and if you do that, you're gonna start a huge number of jobs that are completely independent from one another. And that puts a heavy load on the scheduler and it's also kind of difficult for you to manage because you, it's not easy for you to just you say, oh, I made a mistake. I want to kill all those jobs because they're not really connected in any way. Um, DSQ and array jobs, um, as you'll see, allow you to submit a whole lot of independent things while keeping them uh, sort of organized, keeping them bound to one another. So that's a better way to do that. We, we had a lot of problems with this, especially people submitting large numbers of very short jobs, you know, jobs that ran in less than a minute. Maybe somebody, boom, they'd send out 10,000 one minute jobs, which caused the scheduler to completely melt down. So um, we have a limit right now of, you can't submit more than 200 jobs in an hour. If you try the 201st job will actually fail when you try to submit it. Um, so if you run into that, um, take a look at what you're doing and see if, if you can do it better. Questions about that? Okay. Yeah, I just want to um, turn here to the question about or the issue of how to take a look at your job while it's running and seeing if it's if it's doing something reasonable, if it's reasonably efficient. And I, um, I love, you know, it's, it'd be great if everybody did this with all their jobs, <laughs> with all, it, you know, the first time they ran a particular job um, to take a look at it, make sure that it's doing what they think it's doing and that it's, um, it's using the resources that it asked for. So, so what do we want? What do we want to see? You've asked for a certain number of, of CPUs, cores, same thing. Um, are the, are you using all of them? Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times somebody has submitted a job asking for 20 CPUs and they use one. It happens all the time. And it's a very, you know, it's, it's, it's so easy to have happen. I mean, it, I've, it's happened to me too. You just make a small mistake and the, and the job won't run in parallel, but you've allocated this huge number of CPUs and the job is running sequentially. So um, the good news is it's pretty easy for you to, to, to figure, to see that that has happened and then to try to address it. Um, but you need to look. So, so that's one thing. Um, if your code is running near 100% CPU, then you're pretty. You can be pretty sure that you're not um, wasting all your time doing disk I/O. And that's another thing you want to be aware of. If your code is really struggling with disk I/O, there's often something that can be done to to address that problem and make the thing run much faster. Um, you want to make sure that if you ask for GPUs that you're actually using them. Because a lot of codes, you launch them, if they can't find the GPU, they'll run on the CPU, they'll still run. They'll just run really, really slowly. And um, it's sort of the same idea. You, you, you want to make sure you're using that, that resource and you're getting the parallelism that's available. Um, and you want to kind of have an idea of how much memory your code is using. Um, so um, all those things are important. So um, a lot of the techniques that I use for looking into this stuff are pretty low tech, they're pretty straightforward, um, but they're effective. And my favorite one is to simply go to the node where the job is running and run top and see what top is telling you. Top is a really nice Linux command that tells you the memory usage and the CPU usage, um, and um, it's very easy to use. So basically the idea is, um, First, have to figure out where your job is by using SQ and then um, SSH to that compute node and then run top. So um, I'm, in a second, I'm going to actually show you guys that real quick. Um, top does not know about GPUs. So for answering the question, am I using my GPUs, you need to do something else. And in that case, um, NVIDIA has this utility, NVIDIA SMI, that um, you can, again, you go to the compute node where your job is running, and then you run NVIDIA SMI, and it'll um, show you uh, what's going on with uh, GPUs. So I have actually a screenshot of NVIDIA SMI here. So it basically lists all of the GPUs on the node, and it tells you what percentage of the GPU sort of um, maximum utilization you're getting. So in this case, 
Um, we're not getting tremendous um, utilization out of them, but at least we can see that we're using them. Um, a lot of GPU codes kind of go back and forth between the GPU and the CPU. So it's, it's not that uncommon to see numbers here well under 100%. And that may not be a terrible thing, but if you see zero there, then um, that's bad. <laughs> so then you know you're not using it at all. Um, so let me just quickly show you that. Let's see, so where was it here? Ah, oh, yeah. So I'm still actually in Tmux. <laughs> um, I have the code base for the examples here. Um, so this is a very simple, oh, is that reasonably legible? This is a very simple batch job. Um, maybe it's just worth quickly going through it since it's the first batch script we saw. So you probably know you always put this at the beginning of the batch job uh, script so that um, it knows uh, what program to use to run the script. And nearly 100% of the time, that's going to be batch. So this is pretty much what they all look like. Then we've got this section here where we can uh, put some of the options to sbatch into the script so we don't have to keep repeating them on the command line. So all of these options could be on the command line, but there are not things we want to change all the time because we put them in the script. This will give me an email when it runs. This sets it 10 minutes, the time limit. This says I want four CPUs. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with loading modules. The, the program we're going to run is BWA, so we load the, the BWA module. Um, this is a hack here just to give me a little bit of time uh, to SSH to the node. Um, and then here's the actual command. So BWA mem, um, this is a program, B BWA mem is a program that knows how to use more than one CPU. Um, you give it a dash T and a number. I could have just written four here, but instead I wanted to get a little tricky. This environment variable here will take on this value. Whatever dash C is, um, this environment variable will be set to it. Um, and then this is the rest of the, the command, the, the, map, the reference genome I'm mapping against um, the reads that I'm going to map and the output file. This is a little bit of um, bash trickery that's kind of unfortunate that it's necessary. Turns out if you, if you let the number of CPUs be default, you don't explicitly say dash C anything. You say, oh, I know by default it's one. Um, Slurm does not set this to one. It, it sets it to nothing. It's unset, which is not ideal. Um, this is just a, a bash hack for saying if this, if this isn't set, default it to one. So I have to do it here rather than having Slurm do it properly. So that's the script. If I go ahead and um, submit that thing with an S batch, And now I do an SQ. You can see that it's uh, not running yet. Hang on. Hopefully this won't take too long. Always the, the thing about, so this is in the day partition. That's the default partition on Grace. And if it doesn't run pretty quick, I'll cheat a little bit, but. There it goes. Okay, so it took about a minute, maybe, or 30 seconds to start running. We can see it's running on C16 and 11, right? Here. So I'm going to quick SSH to C16 and 11. And I'm going to run top. And top will show me everything there. I just want my stuff, so I do that. So you see BWA, and I'm, this is probably going to quit quickly. So I'm going to kill it so we can watch it. We can look at it before it ends. Um, this is exactly what we want to see. So I, I asked for four CPUs and it's getting 400% of the CPU. So, so this code is running almost perfectly in parallel. So if we'd seen 100% there, that would be bad in this case, because that, that would essentially mean I'd screwed up the, par the, the request for parallelization and it would be running sequentially. Okay. Now, another thing about the way I did that 
um, environment variable uh, to PWA. Let me just go back there and remind you of that. So because I did this, I can now override the dash C with a different value. Man line takes precedent. Let's do six. Oh, I should have submitted it to the cheating partition, but we'll be patient. Sort of patient. All right, let me do it again. Uh, I have a special partition I can submit to for things like this that has higher priority. Whoops. Okay. Probably the other one's running now. Yep. <laughs> okay, so C16 on 11. This is... You can see that it, it's running at almost 600%, right? So it's just a nice a nice way to arrange this kind of program. A program that you give a number to and it's gonna run to, um, parallel to that extent. You match that to the number of CPUs you request and everything works great. Any Any questions about that? Yeah. I don't know if there's any variety between the nodes. But is there any way to see um, talk about CPU or maybe like this bottleneck if it's memory bandwidth? Um, yeah, there's no good way for you to see that. I mean, basically, I think what you want to be looking for is good CPU utilization. And if, if you're seeing that, you're probably in good shape. And if and if you're seeing a lot less than 100% times the number of CPUs, then something is wrong. Um, usually it's disk IO because the, the, the latency, so that, that gets into a little bit of a deep topic, but all of the files that you're normally using are on the, the big parallel file system, which is off the node, right? It's, it's across the network and in a big storage system. And it's a very high performance file system, but it's got a lot of people using it. And especially, the latency can be kind of large. So if if you're doing lots of tiny reads, it can slow down. I, at the end of this, and I bet we won't get to it, but take a look at it um, after the, um, you know, when you get home, whatever, and and see that it, it's very easy to do something where you're you're pulling very large files. We have a lot of uh, processes pulling very large files and sort of stomping on one another because they're try each trying to cache that large file and each destroying each other's cache. And so every single byte has to get pulled multiple times. Um, so stuff like that happens, but you'll see that in very poor CPU utilization. So that to me, that would be the, the diagnosis. You know, if you, if, if you see poor CPU utilization, suspect bad IO. I don't know, is that <laughs> kind of answer? <laughs> um, okay. So um, another good thing to do for jobs, if your job, what you know, once your job runs, um, you can run this command seff or ceph. There's sort of a disagreement about how to pronounce this word. Um, that will um, give you a sort of short report on what the job's uh, uh, utilization was. So let me show you that for this job we just ran. Uh, So um, you need the job ID for this. And, and fortunately, by default, the output file contains the job ID, which is very handy. Um, so oh, let me move that up a little bit. So this, this is a nice, you know, sort of very concise report on what happened. It tells you how many cores you had, um, your total CPU utilization, your CPU efficiency, um, your memory utilization, and your memory efficiency. 
So this job was actually pretty big. It was over five gig. Um, had I tried to run this job on a single core, it probably would have failed because the default RAM per CPU is five gigabytes. Um, because I ran on four, I got four times five gigabytes. So I got 20 gigabytes of RAM allocated to me. And so, uh, oh, so was, this was on six. So six times five is 30. Um, so it fit with room to spare. But this is a, you know, pretty simple, but very useful report. It gives you a sense of how good was your CPU utilization, how good was your memory, uh, or how, really how big was your memory footprint. Now you might say, I'm surprised um, to see that 50% that number because it seemed like it was running pretty well. The reason for that with BWA is um, when BWA, BWA starts up, it has to read uh, all of the reference genome in and it's sequential at that point. And it's also IO bound. So the beginning part of the run was pretty lousy efficiency. Um, the longer it runs, the better that number is going to get. So once it's once we got over there and looked at it, it was cranking pretty well, but um, initially it's not. So um, SCFF um, is a very nice tool. If you, if you set up your jobs to get emailed, um, get an email when the job completes, it'll actually stuff the output from SCFF in that email. So you've probably seen that. Um, hopefully I'll have some time to talk about array jobs. Um, there's a an analog of S SCFF for array jobs that we wrote called SCFF array. And um, that gives you lots of um, statistics on your overall array job. Um, I will say that the default output for, um, okay, so a third way to do it is, is using S account. S account dash J job ID will give you a bunch of other information about your job. Once it completes, all of these things are only work on completed jobs. Um, I don't like the default output for S account. It turns out all of the Slurm um, sort of reporting commands are really configurable in terms of what columns you want and what order you want them and how wide they are. And so this is an example of um, telling S account I want a lot of lot more information um, and exactly how I want it. So um, just so you know that that's that's something you can do. I I do the same thing for SQ. I don't like the default output for SQ, so I modified it. I put that in my Bash RC file, and then whenever I run S account, um, I get exactly what I want. Okay. Um, this is just a little housekeeping. We're not going to do this. I've already done this, but if you want to run any of these examples yourself, um, you need to get the data. The data is large. It's too big to fit in GitHub. So um, this is where the data is. So just in case you want to try some of this stuff yourself, um, you'll need to follow this step. So we did that already. OK. So this, this presentation is a lot of little pieces of things. And the, the next little piece of things is um, software installation. So as you almost certainly know, a lot of the software that we install, we do as modules. So the idea, the I, you know, hopefully for you guys, what that means is you say module load, the name of the software, that will set up everything, and then you can just um, run the executables. We used to do that for pretty much everything. In particular, we used to do it for R libraries and Python packages, and that turned into a complete nightmare because there are so many of them and they kind of conflict with one another. And so uh, they just sort of didn't make sense as modules, all those different add-ons to R and Python. So we've transitioned into using a system called Conda that allows you guys to do user level installations. Um, you don't need to be an administrator. It's pretty easy to do. And um, it has a lot of advantages in terms of modularity. So uh, if you do a lot with R, and or Python, um, you'll want to become um, familiar with using Conda. Got um, a lot of information on, on our website about how to do that. We can also help you. So um, it's really a great system because um, it understands all the dependencies. So if you want to install package X, package X depends on a whole bunch of other things that depend on a whole bunch of other things, it'll handle all of that. It's very nice. 
Um, feel free to contact us anytime. I mean, you're, you're always welcome to install something yourself. Give it a try. But if you run into problems, um, get in touch with us. This is a lot of what we do, and we'll try to figure out a way to help you. Uh, we have a lot of tricks. So, yeah, question. Um, so is this no, that's the interesting thing about Conda. So Conda, all as far as I'm, as far as I know, all Conda installation packages are pre-compiled, and um, that's really nice because it means it goes really fast, and you don't have to. You also don't have to worry about those issues. So um, when things work in Conda, they work really well. R, if you when you if if you're in R and you do install packages, that will often involve comp compilation. And that's that's where we actually ran into the biggest problems where people would just do install packages of something, end up inadvertently compiling on one of the new nodes, trying to run on the old nodes. So we actually changed our R systems so that it should, no matter where you are, always compile for the old nodes. So you should, that problem should have gone away now, but I wouldn't be surprised if it pops up again. Um, interestingly, you can use Conda to install R and uh, R packages, and um, some people love that and some people hate it. But it's it's an option. <laughs> I kind of like it. But um, how many of you have used Conda to do an installation? Well, a lot of you. Okay, um, it's pretty straightforward. We've got a lot of information on the, on our website about it. Um, you load our mini so. Couple of gotchas. If you're used to using, so you may have used Conda just on your own laptop, some other place. A couple of differences. Um, we there, there's really no reason for you to install your own version of Conda. We've got Conda as a module, so you you do a module load mini Conda, and then you've got sort of a basic Conda installation. Um, you cannot then do a Conda install into that because we own that. So you need to. As soon as you're going to configure new Conda stuff, you need to create your own environment, uh, custom environment. So you say Conda create name of environment bunch of packages. So that's that's what um, that's what all of this is. Now you'll notice I said Conda and I have Mamba written here. Um, Conda create often runs into problems if you're if you've got a lot of weird dependencies. If it's a complicated situation. And what we found is this is somebody, and I forget who it was, wrote a plugin replacement for Conda um, called Mamba. It does a much better job of installation, but it works exactly the same way. It's just faster and better. And we include it in the mini Conda module. So for all the other Conda um, commands like Conda activate, Conda deactivate, Conda list, et cetera, go ahead and use Conda. But specifically when you're doing create, or install, we recommend that you use um, Mamba instead because it, it's it's just better and faster. So the idea is um, you create your own um, custom environment. You can create lots of different environments. I have 10 or 20 different environments, each with a different set of stuff in, installed in them. You install what you want into them, and then they stick around. You can, you know, they're, they're in, your, um, in your file system. And then when you want to use them, you just you just activate them. So you activate my environment and go ahead and um, and use it. Um, maybe that just serves for those of you who aren't familiar with Conda. Um, now you know it exists and um, take a look at our documentation um, and ask questions if you have any. It, it can be, you know, the first time you use it, it'll probably be a little confusing, but um, I, I guarantee you'll come to really like it. Um, and it's um, once you get get used to it, it's a really great thing. Okay. So a lot of our users use Conda to do um, to create exactly the set of software that they want. It isn't just for Python. It can be Python. It can be R. It can be other things. Um, that handles a lot of our installations. Then. Um, we handle a lot of other installations of like compiled C code, that kind of stuff using modules. But every once in a while, we'll run into something that's really persnickety, that's really a problem because it's uh, it's something that demands um, uh, 
a root access to do the installation, or it wants to have a very specific version of Linux to run on, or a very specific version of all the libraries, like something that's very picky. And, and we can't really adapt the cluster environment to match its um, demands. That just wouldn't work. And we don't wanna be installing a whole bunch of weird libraries for this one application. So in those cases, we can fall back to using something called containers. And I don't know, you may have heard of Docker or Aptainer or Singularity. Those are all different kinds of container technologies. And um, this is really an advanced topic, but um, if you're interested or if you run into something hard, we may decide to build you a container or show you how to build a container. And it's a really powerful tool. Just wanted to make you aware of it really. Um, we, we have a whole workshop on containers that it's, it's been videoed, it's on our website. Um, and we'd be happy to help you with it. Um, it's becoming more common for um, scientists to distribute their uh, applications using Docker. That's a really nice way to distribute software. Um, we don't run Docker, but we run a close relative called Aptainer, and we can often translate Docker containers into Aptainer. So anyway, just, just so you know, there's a thing we're aware of, and we can help you with if you bump into it. And, um, and if you're interested in software development, it might be something that you're interested in learning more about. But I think, I think if more software developers built their software using containers, the world would be a better place because they're so much more portable. So I have some examples here, but I'm not going to dive into them. Yeah. Um, so besides Python and R, um, I don't know if there's an experience where you guys run a cluster uh, um, with um, a Kenya user. Is there any particular you want to mention? Yeah. Um, so we we still have relatively little Julia community, um, but we're interested. I think I think it's going to grow. Um, I myself have never used it, so I'm the wrong person to ask. Um, but I, yeah. I don't know what else to say. I it, it it's I, I believe we have it installed as module, um, and we're definitely interested in supporting it as people. Um, I I've been really meaning to spend some time because what I hear is it's as nice as Python and it's much faster. So um, that all sounds good to me. But um, yeah, are you a serious Julia programmer? Um... I think of myself as one. Okay. So I'm a prospective user, maybe to migrate from this guy to yep. your cluster. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely something we're interested in, and be good to know who's who's using it. Um, okay. Uh, yet another wild segue. Um, storage quotas. So. Um, Just, just a, a couple of words about this. Um, there's a command called get quota that you can run that shows you um, the, the status of your all your quotas on the cluster. Generally speaking, a given user is concerned about um, four different storage locations. Um, you all have a home directory that has a private quota. You have access to a, a piece of your PI's project directory. That thing has a group quota. Similarly, you have a, a access to a piece of your PI's Scratch directory as a different quota. Um, files in Scratch are automatically purged when they get to be 60, 60 days old. So it's just for files you don't care if they get thrown away after 60 days. And, um, and then you, if your PI has bought, uh, so in the same way they can buy nodes, they can buy storage. And we set up a particular um, storage area for that group. Um, we call it a PI partition, but that's a confusing term. A PI storage area, and um, that's a fourth place that you might have a quota on. Again, that would be a group quota. So you just want to um, you want to be aware of where you are in terms of your usage and how close you are to the quota limit. Um, first thing we do when somebody says a program has suddenly started misbehaving when it wasn't before is look at their quota, and it's a good, pretty good chance that that's the problem that they've. Hit their quota and um, and their job died. And unfortunately, and I wish this weren't the case, um, we don't we don't currently have a way to notify you when you hit the quota. You'll you'll just notice it because your jobs will die. Um, not ideal. So again, if you run get quota, it'll 
um, it actually prints out a whole bunch of useful information, it tells you um, how much each member of your group is using on each one of those areas. So you can go harass the person who's um, using all of it, et cetera. Okay, yeah, so, he, so here are some typical quotas for those locations. Um, I just, I want to re-emphasize because it's important that currently the only thing we backed up is home. So in particular project, you might think that project is backed up, but it, it isn't. Hopefully it will be, um, hopefully certainly by the end of the year, but um, hopefully sooner. There are um, some other options if you need more storage. So the first is to get some space on our cluster storage. So this is the PI storage that I mentioned. Um, currently costs, you can you can buy it two different ways. You can buy it for a five-year commitment or a one-year commitment um, at different pricing. Um, that storage is just as fast as everything else. So, that, so that's high performance storage that you can compute against on the cluster. And it's also, it's mounted across all the clusters um, except for Milgram. So um, it's, that's a nice place to put stuff. Um, ITS has an offering called Storage at Yale, which has lots of different variations within it. Um, it's another option. It's not fast enough to be um, actively computed against from the cluster. So essentially what you think of it as, it's, it's storage that you can use and then move stuff over to scratch storage um, and compute against it there. But um, it's safer in the sense that uh, it's replicated. So all of the storage at Yale stuff they, they keep two copies of everything that are geographically distinct. So, um, you know, very unlikely that if even a big failure would cause data loss. So it's that's a nice thing about it. Um, the price ranges depending on which tier that you ask them for. There's lots more information about this. Um, just want to make you aware of that. Um, Google Drive is a funny thing. Until recently, with an Eli Apps account, you could get unlimited storage on Google Drive. And um, that is probably gonna go away, but ITS hasn't entirely figured it out. So I wanna warn you a little bit about that. We keep asking them like, what, what is the plan here? And they're still trying to figure out the plan, but but it they are now charging Yale. So this you know unlimited free storage is no longer unlimited and free to Yale. And the Yale's trying to figure out what to do about that. So, um, Personally, I don't think I would put stuff there. I, you know, I wouldn't put lots of stuff there. We had people that were putting many, many terabytes there because it was a great deal, but um, maybe not such a good idea now. Um, another data related thing, um, Globus. Uh, have many of you heard of Globus? Great. Um, I love Globus. Uh, basically web-based um, file transfer between endpoints. Um, if you're moving data either between your local computer and your lab and the cluster or somewhere out, else out in the world in your lab or the cluster, sort of you're doing big transfers at a distance, um, I would do this. Um, it's pretty easy to use. Like I say, it, although it has um, a command line interface, you can do almost everything from a web page very easily. You can install Globus on your own computer. Um, you, one of the best things about it is it, it's pretty easy to transfer data to um, a non-Yale collaborator using Globus. You can basically set up a folder and share it with that person, even though they don't have Yale credentials and they'll be able to pull data from it or push data into it, which was something very difficult to do any other way. Um, so yeah, so if, you're, if you find yourself moving a lot of data, check this out. It's fast, robust, and um, and easy to use. We have endpoints on all the clusters. Um, ITS is working on getting an endpoint on Storage at Yale that'll see all that stuff. So um, this is every university in the country and probably most of them in the world have endpoints. Uh, it's good. Okay, so with our last thirty minutes. Um, talk a little bit about parallelism. 
So this is a new slide and I, I'm wondering if it's helpful, but th this is kind of the way I think about it. Sort of this hierarchy of how parallel something is. So a standard sequential job is a single CPU using a single task on a single node. Um, and th these are these confusing options that I talked about before. Um, so that's pretty straightforward, no parallelism there. The next layer up is um, a multi-threaded job. So that, that BWA job I showed you that ran on four and then six CPUs and we saw good parallel performance, that was a multi-threaded job. Um, so it had more than one CPU, but it was one task and on one node. So, so that, that job could only expand to be as big as the number of CPUs on, on, a, on a compute node. Um, our compute nodes vary from 20 CPUs up to 64 CPUs. So, that, you know, this used to be a big limitation. It's not so much a limitation now. You can get a very parallel program running on a single node using all of the CPUs on that node. Um, so I think this increasingly is, is a really powerful level of parallelism. And it's also a relatively easy one to program. So it's much easier to, to take a sequential program and turn it into a multi-threaded program than it is to turn it into an MPI program or some sort of big scale parallel program. Just turns out um, multi-threaded program shares all the same memory. It just makes things much easier, sort of in a technical sense. So this is what a lot of our compute um, consists of. But the really big compute that we see um, is MPI compute. So, so here's where you can start lots of tasks spread across the cluster on different nodes, all working on a single problem, passing messages back and forth together. So this is sort of the classic big iron parallel program for HPC. And th these were obviously much more important back when and, um, compute nodes had one, two, or four cores when they were really small. Now the compute nodes are so so big in terms of the number of cores, these are really only, these MPI programs are only really for extremely large parallel par parallel runs. And in that case, what you have is um, more than one task. So that's the way Slurm thinks about it, is it's gonna start a large number of tasks. Those tasks are gonna be spread out across the cluster. There could be some sharing nodes, some not sharing nodes. It doesn't really care so much about that. It's just, they're just smeared out among, um, nodes of the cluster often each one will each one of those tasks will only have a single cpu although it could have more and they talk to each other over the network so like big climate codes do this okay that's sort of the classic the classic example and in, in um earth and planetary sciences they run these big climate codes that'll they'll run on many hundreds of of nodes at the same time on one big problem one big simulation um and then there's a sort of one level, honestly, because now individual compute nodes have so many CPUs, there's a new um, popular way of doing this called hybrid, where um, you use MPI to go across nodes, but within a node, MPI is, is inefficient. So you do shared memory within the node and MPI across the nodes, and that's, that's a hybrid. So, um, give you a sense of these four different kind of flavors, four different levels of parallel job. Um, we tend to focus um, on, on the multi-threaded level as, as, as I've already said. And that's, I already showed you how to do that. It's really very straightforward. If, if, if the application you're running knows how to run multi-threaded, you just have to figure out how to tell it how to do that. And classically, they'll have some flag like P, for um, processes or T for threads, and you give it a number and it automatically starts that many processes or threads and just goes ahead and computes. And your only responsibility there is to make sure you give it enough CPUs. So if you if you gave your program dash P20, but you forgot to give it C20, it would pack all those processes within a single CPU and it would run like a dog. It would be terrible. So you, all you need to do is make sure you give it the right number of CPUs and tell it the right number of processes or threads and, and everything will work out. And I showed you that environment variable that makes that easy so that you don't have to keep those two in sync uh, manually. All that said, 
um, a lot of big parallel jobs that we see are not like any of what I just told you. What they are is hundreds or thousands of completely independent jobs that don't talk to each other at all. And that's um, a really important subcase and it's very easy to run and it makes really good use of the cluster resources. So, so an example of that is um, I've got 10,000 files and I wanna run a program on every one of those 10,000 files. And rather than think of that as a big parallel application, I'm just gonna think of it as 10,000 independent um, jobs that are gonna take an input file and produce an output file. So at the end, I'm gonna have 10,000 output files and then I'll do something with them, okay? Um, or sort of analogously, another way of looking at it is, is I, I want to run a, a program over a whole bunch of different parameters. So I have you know nested parameter sets, and I uh, for some simulation or something, I want to run this program ten thousand times, giving it a different set of of input parameters every time, or maybe even just random numbers. Um, that could be the case as well. So um, for that case where I just want to do a bunch of completely independent runs, each producing an output. Um, there's some very easy ways to do that, uh, that, that any, any of our users are, are capable of setting up. And like I say, they, um, they probably constitute the bulk of the work that's done on the clusters, this, this kind of parallelism. So the, the, the simplest way to, or the first way to do this is called, um, Slurm job arrays. And this is something that Slurm directly supports. So um, this comes right out of the Slurm um, interface. And the idea is you use this um, option here, array, array equals and some range. And that tells Slurm that rather when you do the S batch, rather than run your script once, you want to run it a hundred times once on each value in that range. And it's going to set this um, uh, um, environment variable to the value in question for each instance. So, so basically, th this is our batch script. This batch script is going to be scheduled a hundred times, and uh, the, you know it's going to take on all the different values here. So that's kind of up to you to make that work. So here is a, a really simple example where we've got a hundred input files. And they're, um, they have a, a tag on the end that ranges from one to 100. And so we're going to process each one of those input files and produce a different output file. Again, we're going to tag the output file with the iteration number. Um, pretty straightforward. So we just go ahead and submit this thing a single time. We submit one job, and it's going to turn into um, essentially 100 subjobs. Each one of those subjobs is going to process one input file into one output file. Um, but there, you know, I, I warned you don't don't submit hundreds or thousands of independent jobs. These aren't really independent jobs. They're still bound together, and I can easily um, cancel all of them if I need to, because they're still associated with one another. So let me just uh, quickly show you that in practice. So here, this is a slightly different script. Um, it's only got 10 subjobs, and it's a, it's a more complicated, um, it's actually doing BWA mem again, but it's the same idea. Basically, we have a whole bunch of, of input files, um, genome sequence files. And for each of the genome sequence files, we're going to run uh, BWA, mem, BWA mem, and we're going to um, then run a second program to sort them. So don't worry too much about the details, but the idea is this um, BWA, BWA mem is going to end up being run 10 times, producing 10 output files. So I, I just go ahead and um, test batch. I'm going to put it on admin test this time, I think. Um, array.sh. So what do we see here? So there are 10 jobs running, and they all, if you look at the job IDs here, they have the same major number, but a different minor number. That's how you can kind of keep track of what's going on. Each one of them got scheduled independently. We kind of got lucky that all 10 started immediately, but that if that needn't have been the case, 
I could have submitted a much larger job, like with 10,000 elements, and it would have started some of them, and the rest would be pending. And then as jobs finished and as new CPUs become available, more will get scheduled. So it just sort of work its way through all of those jobs at its own pace. But to make progress, I don't need to have a lot of resource available. As soon as there's a single CPU available, I can, you know, the system will start one more of these jobs. So it's sort of that, that's what I meant when I said it fits into the holes in the in the available um, resources on the cluster. So it sort of works nicely that way. Um, let's see if it's finished. Yep. Okay. So now I'll show you um, this SCFF array. And you give it the major job number. And it, so this is something we wrote, um, tells you for each of the sub jobs, it tells you the elapsed time of the job, um, the utilization of the job. Um, yeah, so this memory, this is actually, um, the quirk of the system. If jobs run really quickly in Slurm, it doesn't have time to capture the memory usage. So um, if, a, if a job runs, these jobs ran in 15 seconds, it's not enough time for Slurm to capture the memory usage. If the jobs would run longer, we'd get a similar histogram of the memory usage. But for this one, it fails just because they didn't run long. Um, so that's how job arrays, how, how many of you have used job arrays? Did anybody use job arrays? Okay. Um, I like job arrays a lot in how they're implemented, but um, sometimes the interface, this, this, you know, sometimes it's hard to map exactly what you want to do onto an integer between one and n in a convenient way. Sometimes that's easy. Sometimes it's a pain in the neck. So um, we created an alternative that's that's very similar, called dead simple queue. That's sort of a long history um, that. Under the covers is a job array. So once you start it running, it's absolutely a job array and all of the normal job array techniques apply. But rather than having to um, do the work of turning an array index into something useful, you just directly create a file where every line is a job and the, every line can be different. They don't need to be the same. It's just whatever you want you know, one task to be, you put that on a line of this job file. The job file can be as long as you want, can be thousands of lines long. Each line is a single task. And then um, you use this DSQ utility to take that job file and um, create a batch script that you can submit. And then you submit the batch script in exactly the same way, and it will run it as a job array where index X will do will perform the work of line X in that job file. So it's, it's really a very thin layer, but we find it a very effective one. So in practice, what I do is I write some little script in Python or something that generates the job file. I can look at it, make sure it's right. And then I go through this and submit it. So I'll show you the same computation done that way. Um, so here is, um, it's, this is exactly the same work, just represented a different way, um, 10 lines. I actually generated that using this, um, Python script. So this is typically, you know, this is, unless it's really short, I'm not going to generate these things by hand. I generate them with, with a piece of, of, um, script and I like Python, so I do it. Python, but you could do it with anything. Um, then you go ahead and submit. Let's see. So module load ESQ. So the the utility is is installed as a module. Um, this utility for creating the batch script. Um, say job file and the name of the job file. Um, so it creates this file and hopefully tells you exactly what to do. Um, and then you just go ahead and run it. 
And if we take a look, we see exactly the same thing essentially. So it's a it's, it's a job array again. Now, um, one other um, little detail here, um, you can add, that's really low, sorry. Let me just, um, so um, in addition, so th this is a required argument to the job file, but you can add any slurm option you want on that same command line and it'll be put into the script. So for example, you could say, I want, I want this time limit. I want to use this partition. I want to use this many CPUs per task. Any of the normal um, Slurm job options can be added on here. Um, like whatever. Okay. And if um, I'll, I'll just show you how that works. So if I, now you can actually open up this script file and take a look. It's not that complicated and we just, um, propagate whatever we put um, into the, the prelude here. So um, this is what I specified here. Um, yeah, this is, you know, this is how we actually make it work. It's not that complicated, but, um, and you can go ahead and edit these files. You can edit above the do not edit line because it's just, it's just a standard batch script stuff. So if you want to change any of that manually, you can. Um, another nice thing about DSQ, what, one of the things that's missing in job arrays that's kind of a little perplexing is they don't have a really good report um, mechanism that says, okay, you submitted 10,000 um, element array job. These five elements failed with this error well, and all the rest, you know, which is fine if you've got 10, but if you've got 10,000, um, it can be kind of a challenge to figure out what what happened and did everything work no that's that, yeah it's right i should say something about that in most respects the individual sub jobs of an array job are independent so if one fails it doesn't kill the rest the time interestingly the time limit is on the individual sub jobs and not on the overall job so you could you could actually in theory submit an array job that went on for months um as long as each individual sub job only ran for, you know, within its time limit, it's kind of a strange idea, but um, the memory limits, all those limits are actually applied to the sub jobs and not to the overall job. I'm an interesting thing. And what uh, it can be really powerful to use an array job with scavenge plus day plus PI partition, because, um, you know, so a few scavenge jobs get killed. Who cares? You just go back and rerun them. And I was actually going to show you how, how that works. So um, there's an autopsy script, DSQ autopsy, and you give it a job file, um, BWA, BWA, oops, jobs, text, and the job ID, which we fortunately have here. And it it will um it'll give you a, a, a report on what happened. And um you see that two of these jobs failed, right? Um job index um zero and one actually failed with an out of memory error. And that's exactly what I mentioned before that um the BWO is playing pretty close to the edge here. <laughs> in terms of needing about five gig per run. And the default here is five. So it's, I, I'm not exactly sure, honestly, why two failed and eight succeeded. It could be that the, um, the input files are slightly different sizes or something. But what we could do is um, redo it like this. If we ran, if we now tell our task to do 10 gigabytes, then it'll all work. But the the real message here I'm trying to give you is um, that autopsy um, makes it much easier to figure out what happened. And, and you can also, uh, right, you can have it print out a new job file um, that only contains the lines that failed. So that, that then is very convenient. If you had a file with 10,000 lines of it and 500 random elements of it failed, if you use autopsy to generate a new job file, 
with just those 500 failed jobs, then you could run those. So check that out. A um, lot of people use this tool and find it um, really useful. Okay, I'm going to wrap up because we're almost done. So I'm going to skip a little bit here. Um, I'll, I'll just say one word about profiling. Um, if you don't know about profiling, it's a really powerful concept. The idea being, um, if, um, it's unlikely that all of your code is evenly taking time, that there's probably some kernel in your code, if you're writing your own code, and, and it could be in C, it could be in Python, it could be in R, it's probably some very small subset where most of the time is being spent. And it may not at all be obvious which little segment of your code that is, and it may be even less obvious why that is. Um, and so um, a very powerful way to, do, to, to look into that is to profile your code It'll tell you, depending which profiler you use, which function or even which line is dominating your runtime. And then you can look at that line or function and, and ignore everything else and just try to address what's going on there. And if you can speed that up, then you'll speed up your whole code. So um, pretty much all programming languages have some facility for doing profiling. And um, if you're doing a lot of programming and you don't know about profiling, you should you should learn how to use the profiler for your particular language. I have some examples here in Python, but I'm going to skip them. Um, this is kind of a fun thing. If you have time, take a look. Um, this is a an application we actually got that was going to take probably years to run if it ever would complete because it was repeatedly downloading a huge file. And by caching that huge file and structuring things a little bit differently, it could run in an hour. So just an example of how thinking about what your code's actually doing and the order it's doing it in can make a huge difference. Okay, so this is my last slide. Um, uh, if you need help with anything, just send an email to hpc at yale.edu that goes into, into our ticketing system, but don't know it's, it's not like sending to Verizon or something. It's going to go to uh, about five of us and, you know, you'll get to know us. So we just do that to kind of keep things organized. Um, and we'll send you an email back and figure out what the problem is. Um, I already told you about the website. We um, not too long ago instituted office hours and um, they're on Zoom. They've been pretty popular. Um, this is uh, also on our website in case um, don't remember this, but you can just... Um, at this time, every one hour, every Wednesday, um, two of us are always on that Zoom call and um, show up and we'll see if we can help you. And if we can't help you right then, we'll tell you we can't help you right then because we don't know the answer and we'll set up a separate um, a separate time to get in deeper. And we're always available for scheduled consultation. You don't have to limit yourself to that office hour. Personally, I kind of like it when people tell me they want to have a consultation and why they want to have it so that I can prepare a little bit. Um, so feel free to do that for sure. Um, yeah. So that's it. Um, I'd be happy to have any last questions that you guys have. You've been very patient. So <laughs> it's been nice to be back here. Thanks for coming. I'll stick around for a while, so feel free. Yeah. People probably already know the answer, so I'm just going to ask you. Because <laughs> you talk about how to um, utilize multiple CPU, base, basically your job have to be able to run in parallel, but how do we optimize the memory use? That has sort of been a mystery. Are you pro writing your own program? or No. No. So you really can't change that. Um, um, if, if it's, you know, the program is written the way it's written. Mm -hmm. So it's what... What your job is to figure out what the memory usage is, how mm -hmm. big it is. Um, and that really has to be done through experimentation. So um, I mean, the usual technique is just to try it. And mm -hmm. if it runs out of memory, ask for more memory. And keep asking for more, more memory until it works. Gotcha. And then once it works, SCFF should tell you how much it actually needed. Mm -hmm. 
and then you kind of know where you are. And the tricky bit there is it's sometimes dependent on your input files too, right? It's not just the program, but sometimes the program plus the input files. So if you ch dramatically change the size of your input files, you may find that the memory usage changes. So it's, it's yeah, there's no, there's no simple solution to it other than kind of keeping an eye on how much memory any particular run needs and mm -hmm. kind of watching that and see if it changes for different input sets and stuff like that. So, gotcha. yeah. So you mentioned that for deep WA, BWA, for example, it takes almost more than five gigabytes. Is it common for programs to be like that? Should I? Um. Yeah. So our currently our default is five per CPU. So that's what we kind of think the, I mean, implicitly, well, we kind of got there actually because the amount of memory we were buying in a node divided by the number of CPs we were buying was about five, <laughs> honestly. Um, kind of was like a fair share of the memory. Um, but most small programs will easily fit in five. It's, okay. it's yeah. Um, genome mappers are not small programs because they have to read in this big um, reference mm -hmm. genome usually. And so that's going to take some memory. So th there's no, there really is no simple answer, honestly. It's mm -hmm. really, you just have to kind of get used to what your program needs. And and also learn what's available on the cluster. I, it's because our clusters are so heterogeneous. Some of them have relatively small amounts of RAM. Some have a lot of RAM. Sometimes you can go to the big mem partition and get huge amounts of RAM. So um if you run into problems and you can't figure out how to get your program to run because it's running out of memory, probably the thing to do is get in touch with us and we'll mm -hmm. take a look and see if we can help. Cool. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Sure. Can we set the links to the slides? Yeah. Uh, again? Where the um, link is to the slides? Yeah. yeah. Good idea. That's what you want, right? Yeah. Yep. For resource intensive stuff, mm -hmm. like running alpha full, mm -hmm. um, is dead simple queue the best way to go if I wanted to do like a you know 40 or 50 jobs or something like that? Wow. Well, 40 or 50 alpha full jobs. Potentially. Yeah. Um, well, I would start with one and understand what it needs, and yeah. then we could talk about it. But so a lot of people are using GPUs with alpha full. Yes. Are you exactly. are you doing that? Yes. Yeah. So you're unlikely to be able to get 40 or 50 GPUs. Um, at one time. So, so in other words, would it, so typically I can run like three jobs at time. Okay. And I max out my memory. Ah. I take the ton of memory. So, like, schedule that. a whole bunch of them that way. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. Plan. Sure. Right. Yeah. And it'll just give me the resources as they're available. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And then for transfer, especially, so we have a ton of stuff on. Can I just ask one question about yeah. helpful? Um. Uh, what models of GPUs are you finding you need, and how much VRAM are you needing? First, I wasn't specifying. Um, Michael Strickler suggested a particular combination that I've, that I've been asking for, okay. um, and it, it runs okay. Great. Um, my failures have been memory mostly. Yeah, that's why I'm asking because we're you know as we're buying, so we're we're always buying new G GPU nodes, and there's always a question: Do we buy the really expensive ones with a lot of VRAM, or do we buy the less expensive ones? Yeah. Have a single precision and less VRAM, and because they're so much cheaper. Yeah. And and. So feedback from users in terms of what they need. We don't want to overbuy the really expensive ones, but we also don't want to not have enough of the big ones yeah. for people who need them. And so it's good my, to know what's going on. Yeah, my initial impression was that it didn't make a huge difference when I, when I asked for the high end. Okay. Cool. Yeah, no, I, I, I think um, once you're reasonably confident, you know how to run the alpha fold jobs successfully, setting them but uh, as an array job makes a lot of sense, or, or DSQ, whichever yeah. is more convenient. That's, yeah. For me, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Great. Right. Yeah, thanks. Hi. Um, thanks Great. for that presentation. Sure. Um, I suppose, um, as I said, I'm still kind of thinking about potentially migrating um, over. And I suppose my two big concern was I think you've answered the first about interactive sessions. So I, I, I mostly work in notebook mm -hmm. style, style software jupiter uh I specifically, um i specifically work with vs code that okay kind of yep you so i didn't mention vs code but okay. we just got vs code working in open on demand so you should try it um right. i'm not familiar with it so um 
but it, but it supposedly it works really well. So you should at least know it exists. Right. Yes, code exists on open on demand. Um, good. So I mean, th this seems like a lot more than I thought I sh should yeah, have any right to expect to have. So um, on that front, I'm very happy. Uh, well, my second question was, wh whom mm, should I probably get in touch with um, if I wanted to do that migration? As I said, I'm a predominantly Julia user. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that I'm invested tens of thousands of lines into it, but but still, I don't know how portable it would be to just migrate over and run. Uh, uh... Should be pretty easy. I mean, it, it, do you have an account already? Uh, not yet. That's an administrative issue, kind of through which PI to open it. So I'll mm -hmm. get around to that later. But I don't. Yep. Um, I mean, it's not hugely well. It depends on how much you're going to use. If you're going to be a really heavy user, that could cost your PI something. So then you should probably pick the right one. Right. <laughs> but... so, so, the, so the issue is, I have my own grant, but I'm not a PI. Okay. So so I'm not sure if I just need someone to sign off on right. on, on funneling my, my grant. Okay. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be a heavy user. I don't yeah. think I'll hit that twenty five thousand. Then it's not a problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, not a problem. It's more about just the the, the technical. Um, I I don't think perfect. I mean. So none of us I don't think are deep in Julia, but mm -hmm. just in terms of getting your files over and learning how to run on the system, I think any of us could help you. So. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe just, you might just reach out and ask for a one-on-one -on -one and we can see who can talk to you. Okay. That'll be lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thanks for talking. Um, uh, I was just wondering, I have these, uh, loops for SBOSH jobs and I never heard about the, the SQ, mm -hmm. the, the, the SQ. DSQ. Yeah. Yeah. So we always need to set up those parameters, like for more for the parallelism happens and which which one you think is better like because if you write a loop you can run but i feel like you will finish one job to start a new one on a new file and then going over it again and with the sq you can just run a, the real parallelism that's what you yeah step the the table i'm not totally sure i understand um so are you did you write a loop around S batch? Is that inside the S batch? Inside of yes, S batch. Yes, yes. So okay. so you so so your S batch is script and inside the S batch you have a bash loop. Yes, there's a there is a loop, a bash loop, and then okay. goes over like for mapping uh, yep. uh sequence. So that will not be parallel, right? That's gonna be sequential. Sequential, yeah. right. So but basically, I mean it's almost in that case, it's almost as simple as it's it, that take that same loop and just um, do an echo of the command rather than run it mm -hmm. to a file. What out? What got output from that would be almost exactly what you need for your job file. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. And then yes. you just submit that with DSQ, and it should work. I mean that that's that's essentially exactly how I create a, a job file is by mm -hmm. writing a loop around the command and printing it out. And um, then running a, and, like and you set the how many CPUs or tasks you want to, and yeah. then you get each running. Yes. Yeah, in the parallel way. Yeah, right. So, so this is a way to think about it. You've just got you know some number of lines in this file. Mm -hmm. DSQ is going to turn into a, a task array, a job array, and and each job is going to run as soon as there are resources for it. It could run all of them at the same time or just a okay. few, and each job is going to get the resources in that you specified to slurm, just the same way you do for any job. Mm -hmm. So if you if you don't say anything, you're gonna get the normal five gigabytes and one CPU Did for you... each of those jobs. So in total, you're gonna get a lot more because you could have a lot of them running at the same time. Yes. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, yes. I yeah. see. There's more, if you look at the DSQ page on our website, you know, if any of this is confusing, I, we have a lot of information there, but yes. um, yeah, it should be very simple to take your bash loop and turn it into a script that just creates the job file and then do what I did, you know, use DSQ to create the, the new batch script and then submit that. And, and it'll run in parallel. Yeah. Because it takes sometimes a lot of run time and yeah, yeah. You're not really getting good advantage of the cluster by doing it that way. Mm -hmm. So and you're not the first person I've seen who's done that. Yeah. And then the typical thing people do. <laughs> Which is that they'll put an and in an and side at the end of the command, you know, in yes, Linux, like put slash. in the background. No, the okay. ampersand. Oh, the ampersand. Okay. Yeah, because that means do it in the background. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so then you get 
hundreds of rogue processes running on one node, all stepping on each other. Yeah. It's just terrible. Yeah. So, um, and, and often then, yeah, that's a mess. So don't do it that way. Yeah, um, I, I, I did that conclusion thinking about that. Just if I set up some different amount of CPU usage and I run a loop, a loop, yeah, it they won't. will give, oh, I have enough. If only it would. Yeah, there, yeah, there are tricky ways to do that. Yeah. Um, there's there's a tool called GNU Parallel that if you knew how to do it, you could do what you're talking about. But DSQ is much simpler and it'll work fine yes. for you. Right. And, the, and the really nice thing about DSQ is it doesn't assume any number of, of CPUs are available. You know, it's not going to wait until 50 CPUs are available or 100 CPUs are available. It's going it, to, it'll start running as soon as a single CPU is available. It'll just and take then, as much as it can get. And then it will uh, increase the number of CPU after it, the, the results got yep. Uh, yep. available. Yep, exactly. Okay. Yep. Yeah.